Hello, this is Thomas with LibertarianProgressive.com and also blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. And you'll find over 40 interviews so far this year at LibertarianProgressive.com of independent and third-party candidates, mostly running for Congress. And the reason why we're doing this is because there's a lot more going on this election cycle than just who's running for president. There's 435 members in the U.S. House of Representatives and another 100 members in the Senate who are running for Congress. And today we're interviewing one of them, uh, Dan Phillip, who's an independent for the U.S. House, uh, District Number 7 for Ohio. And we decided, because we've seen polls for the last 10 years or so of congressional approval ratings of under 20%, ranging anywhere from as low as 9%, to as high as 20% approval ratings. Other polls saying that only a quarter of people would uh, decide to re-elect their current congressperson. So there really is a vacuum for this kind of information. We're deciding to make it a little bit easier for people to let them see uh, here are some candidates who are not incumbents and the only third party or independent option in their district. Now, Dan is joining us today, and you can find out more information at danphilipforcongress.com, D-A-N-P-H-I-L-L-I-P-F-O-R, congress.com. And Dan, again, is running as an independent. Dan, good to talk with you today, sir. And is this your first time running? And what inspired you to run this year and also run as an independent? Yeah, well, it's good to be on your show. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate that very much. Um, Well, I actually was on the ballot as an independent in 2014 for the same office. And then I voted in a primary. Then I was disqualified to run as an independent according to the uh, Board of Elections in Stark County, uh, Ohio. So I didn't appeal, but that was no use. It was two Republicans, two Democrats that made the decision as to whether or not I could be on the ballot. So I went back at it again this year. We're on the ballot. Uh, We did everything right according to the rules that they laid out and really the reason for running if we just take a look at the division of people in our country we take a look everything seems to be going broke whether it's welfare social security whether it's medicare medicaid our debt is nearing 20 trillion dollars we've deficit spent for 45 of the last 50 years and i think um we're hearing a lot from the Republicans and Democrats as to what they're doing, what they're trying to do. We're hearing that there's gridlock, but it seems to me that there's only gridlock when it comes to not overspending. Uh, They've tripled the debt in the last 16 years. So there's no gridlock when it comes to spending. There's just gridlock when it comes to saving. So I felt we needed a new voice. I felt we needed somebody other than a Republican and a Democrat. Uh, They seem to be melding together as one anymore. And so we need a new voice. Yeah, there's, uh, they all want to spend. I guess they're just arguing over what to spend it on. And now you have three main issues on your website. It's time to return ownership of the political process to the people. It's time to reduce the national debt and cut away excessive spending and regulation. It's time to protect the public interest from the special interest and represent the people with transparency and accessibility. And we'll go over each one at a time here. But let me just um, ask you some other questions real quick about the election process itself. Have there been any debates, Dan, and are there any debates coming up? There are not debates. There are numerous candidate forums. Most people, most communities seem to fear having a debate. They want to have a clean, nice, kind type of an arrangement. So most of the arrangements so far have been you get a chance to speak for three minutes or five minutes. Some of them allow for questions and some don't. So it's, it's not typically you don't get into a debate format. You just get into a three to five minute um, conversation and then it's, it's over. So we haven't had a lot of in-depth meetings or conversations on the issues. Well, wow, that sounds really quick. It's yeah, it's a long time American political tradition to have the debates before an election. That way, people can see the candidates interact and hear them on the issues. The, some of the debates have 
definitely altered the course of the uh, trajectory of the election before the election. What about getting the signatures on your website? You talked a little bit about going door to door, uh, getting to know people. Do you think the system is fair for an independent right now running? Should there be any election laws changed or processes that would make it a fairer system? Well, you know, at first I thought how unfair to make an independent knock on so many doors and get thousands of signatures uh, because we know that a Republican or Democrat only needs 50 signatures, I believe, or 100 signatures to get on the ballot. But an independent in Ohio, we need 1% of the total vote cast in the prior gubernatorial election. So in 2014, I had to have 2,672 valid signatures. And in 2016, I needed 1,880. So at first, it seems very unfair, but I, I have to say, I think they intended the rules to be unfair. But what it does do, if you take it seriously, it forces you to go out and knock on doors and talk to people and listen to what they have to say. So I think really, in a sense, they're doing me a favor and they're doing independence a favor because we should be in the community. We should be knocking on doors. We should be talking to as many people in the district as possible and listening to them. And so in the last two years, I personally have knocked on now just over 6,000 doors. And I have talked with and listened to many different people. And the sad reality is the, well over 90% of the people I have spoken with and listened to, they have an apathy that says my voice doesn't matter anymore, my vote doesn't count. And when you go to Washington, uh, what's going to prevent you from becoming a crook just like the rest of them? So there's this this uh, malaise, uh, this this attitude of people that they don't matter anymore. And to me, that's the most dangerous part of being a constitutional republic is when people believe they no longer matter, so they no longer get involved, which allows for those who are being elected to really have free reign and go do what they want to do, and we can see what the results of that have been. So we have to go out and engage. So really it's at first glance, it seems unfair, but the reality is everybody should have to do that. Yeah, maybe the Republicans and Democrats should be required to do the same thing and go door to door as well. Um, well, Dan, let's look at the issues here. Um, the first issue, we want to take them one at a time. I mean, you can mix and match it how you want, but is return ownership of the political process to the people? You're touching on that a little bit, but that's number one on your list here. And so how would you approach that to return ownership of the political process to the people? Well, I think there's a couple things you have to do. And, and knocking on the doors that I have, it gave me that, that sense, that, that pulse of the people that they want to matter and they want their voice to be heard and they want to know that the people they're sending to Washington are actually listening to them. We can see the results of those who have been sent to Washington have been horrific, but if we would continue to meet with and to knock on doors and to be accessible to the people, that's one of the, the issues in our district. The current congressman is so inaccessible. I, I don't even receive his, his weekly updates. I get weekly updates from other congressmen, but I don't get weekly updates from my own. The people in the district don't know the name of their congressman. They don't know anything about him. I believe we have to be accessible. We have to get out of Washington. And some get out of Washington every weekend to get home because they need to get out of that culture that corrupts and get back into their district so that people know them and people in their district hold them accountable. So I think being accessible to the people in your district to where they get some level of knowing who you are and knowing what you're doing and knowing that you're listening to them uh, I think what the big, maybe the biggest issue really is regaining the trust of the people and, and asking them and inviting them to come back into the, the process and be engaged in the process. Invite them to come to Washington. And I know it sounds crazy, but why not have them come to Washington and, and go into the Congress and let Congress see these people want to have a say. They're tired of being pushed away and being ignored. So that's one of the things I think I would do to help re-engage, because if they're not engaged in the process, the process will get worse. 
All right, and we'll com- I do have a follow-up question on that. I'll, I'll save it for after these issues um, remaining here. It's time to reduce the national debt and cut away excessive spending and regulation. So if anyone's looked at the debt clock um, recently, you know, you can watch it in live time as it keeps ticking away. It's somewhere between 19 to $20 trillion. Um, you have that as a major issue. How important is our national debt, and what would you do uh, about it? Well, money really is the answer to everything. Everybody has to have money, and when you don't have money, you reduce your flexibility, you reduce your, your options and your choices, and you're very limited. Um, and it's interesting, lately, Congress... Many of the congressmen come back, especially the Republicans come back, and claim that they've been reducing the deficit over the last few years. But the fact of the matter is that was all smoke and mirrors, and the reductions that they had for a couple years are going to go into the 2017, 2018, and 2019 budgets, and there will no longer be deficits. And so when you lose, uh, when you go into debt, it really destroys any liberty that you've got, and our country is in such much so much debt that our liberties are at risk, and we actually see how we're losing some of those. Uh, and the debt continued, as a matter of fact, it's projected over the next 10 years with current legislation on the books, it's projected to go up another $9.5 trillion. So in the next 10 years, we're going to go from a 19.5 to almost just under a $30 trillion debt. And we're eating up nearly 80% of the GDP in our country which is not a good thing for our nation to be uh, at. And so to reduce debt, they haven't even started. And if you look at the General Accounting Office, they will give you a pretty good idea as to the many agencies, the many programs that are um, duplicated, replicated, fragmented, uh, distorted, and just out of control. There are, there are hundreds of billions of dollars that can be streamlined, cut, reduced. Uh, But the fact of the matter is, when your job is on the line, are you going to cut it? Are you going to do things that cut your job out? For example, there are 42 different um, agencies that deal in non-emergency transportation, and they're all duplicating, replicating, and overlapping each other. It doesn't make business sense to keep 42 agencies to to duplicate the things that each other agency is doing. So we can take a list of those kinds of wasteful spending that the General Accounting Office has, and anybody in the audience can take a look online and and see these things for themselves. There are plenty of places to reduce and to cut and to streamline. And the answer that most of the congressmen come back to say is, well, that's that's so minuscule, it's not going to help. But it's just like a budget at your home. If you don't start, you will never, ever reach your goal of getting out of debt. So that's where I would start to reduce our debt. And here's some other interesting information. We pay $255 billion a year just on the interest on that debt. The average American worker will have to work 80 hours a year just to help pay the interest on the debt. That's immoral, and I don't know how a congressman can look at anybody who works and tell them they're doing a good job trying to trying to reduce the debt. Yeah, and I suppose we're lucky that the uh, interest is less than 1% right now because if it was even in normal areas, I suppose, or normal amounts, it's, you know, 1% to 3%, it would be a lot more than $250 billion a year, and uh, that also affects the value of the dollar and economics and our leverage with um, – other countries, and the GAO is a good place to look at. They break things down, and, and talking about the GAO, uh, the Government Accounting Office, which uh, you're getting your numbers from, do you think the full government should be uh, audited? There's some departments, like the Department of Defense, that hasn't really had an audit hardly ever, uh, the Federal Reserve. There's some other departments um, that might not, that, that probably get audits more often, but uh, What do you say about auditing the entire government uh, from top to bottom and just seeing exactly where everything stands? Well, every single agency needs to be audited. And here's one example as to why. Um, Within the Dodd-Frank bill back in 2010, there was an agency created within that particular bill uh, had something to do with consumer protection. 
and it sounded good in the title and so forth. But what we have come to find out, that particular agency was not receiving their budget from Congress. There was no approval uh, coming from Congress. Congress didn't even really know where their dollars were, were, were coming from. And what we find, found out is they were directly being funded by the Federal Reserve. Now, that's illegal. That's unconstitutional. Uh, there was another agency under the uh, Naturalization and Immigration Department that was raising their own funds through fees that they would charge, and that's not uh, legal, and that's not constitutional. And I would tell you that if we would audit every single agency, we're going to uncover things that our federal government doesn't want the taxpayers to know what's going on because they'll see even more waste, even more fraud that's taking place. When you're that big, uh, you can't control it, which is a good example of these two agencies where Congress had no idea. And maybe they weren't paying attention because they didn't want to know what was going on because their attitude anymore is what can they do about it. Uh, They keep saying if we have a new president, if we have a new president, then we'll be able to do this. So that says they're sitting on their hands not doing anything. So to not audit is to do a disservice to the taxpayer in our country. And I think that, again, is just uh, unacceptable. So, yeah, I absolutely believe we need to be doing that. Um, And we also need to go back to requesting annual budgets from every agency and then sending those to the president. Uh, That will do a lot because he's going to have to, uh, uh, I think, write a statute for each and every one of those budgets. Uh, And we're not doing that. We We do the omnibus bills and we vote on everything at one time. And our congressmen don't, don't read that. They don't know what's in it. And so these budgets get passed sometimes, of course, and they don't even know what's in it. So we need to send individual budgets from each agency every single year to the president's office. And if we did that, we would not be hearing things like uh, continuing resolution. We wouldn't be hearing things about shutting the government down. Uh, It would be a lot more transparent and a much better way to run a business. All right, that sounds good. Those are some good examples, and like you said, if there was an audit everywhere, there would probably be so many, so many more examples. We definitely would not have time to talk about them all today, of course. Um, Now, you had another issue here, Dan, and again, for anyone tuning in, we're talking with Dan Phillip, who's an independent candidate who's going to be on the ballot this November 8th, the only independent or third-party option in his district, number 7, for Ohio and uh, for the U.S. House of Representatives. You also stated here it's time to protect the public interest from the special interests and represent the people with transparency and accessibility. And there's a lot of special interests. There's a lot of lobbying. There's a lot of, it seems like, revolving doors as well and so on. How would you address that and, and how is that hurting uh, our confidence and our representatives and hurting America? Well, we reelect our congressmen 90% of the time. Uh, people, that comes back to what we talked about a little bit earlier, where they're just not engaged in the process. And many people who do go vote, they vote for a party or they vote for a name that they already know. Um, many people that I talk to, Democrat, Republican, say they're going to vote for the Democrat ticket or the Republican ticket. Uh, that's what they've always done. So that's what they do. Uh, But when you take a look at the contributions, which, again, is public knowledge, everybody can take a look and see who gets what from where and how much. Uh, We need to take a look at that because when you start to see the millions of dollars that come into each and every one of the incumbents, you really and then you take a look at their voting record. See, the American people are going to have to get a little bit um, more aggressive in looking into what's going on in their own district. Uh, So that's something that we need to encourage and need to even educate our district on and to show them. And simply, there's so many different websites they can go to to look up this information. Uh, And when they take a look at the candidates, they can see who's paid that candidate, and then you can understand the way they vote from time to time. Uh, So that is one way to help protect uh, the, the public interest by making sure they're more involved in the process. And they can take a look at my um, FEC filings and see that all of my donations and contributions are coming from individuals. They're not coming from any particular group at all. And at this point, I haven't been endorsed by some of those uh, 
um, organizations either, and you got to take a look at the endorsements. Why would they endorse somebody? So we have to take a lot more interest as people in, in the election process in who we elected and who we put into that office uh, along the way. So I think that's probably the first and best thing that we can do. And there certainly could be some changes in campaign finance, finance laws and uh, and take a look at that. I, I, I'm sure we can make some better choices there as well. So those are a couple of ways I think uh, we can take a look at public interest over special interest because the special interest has really divided our country. We have a lot of divisions. We have one of the first one of the questions people ask me is, are you left or are you right? Are you Republican? Or are you Democrat? Uh, do you favor gay marriage? Do you, those are some of the first questions they ask, and those are all very divisive questions. Uh, so I try to turn the conversation back first to what is your name and who are you? And let's get to know each other just a little bit in this conversation before we get to a division. So I think that's another way to start working on the public interest as opposed to special interest. All right, Dan, and, All right. and that's why we're here at LibertarianProgressive.com are interviewing people running for Congress. There's, again, a lot more going on this November 8th than just the presidential election. The Congress is a co-equal branch of government. We believe it deserves a co-equal amount of time in the media, and actually Congress can override vetoes. Congress has a lot of power, and if they choose to you know, use the responsibility that it was intended for Congress – would you rather trust a person who's knocking on thousands of doors or someone who only needed 50 signatures and, you know, was uh, the heir inherent to the position? Now, let me ask you, um, you say you want to keep the people involved. There are some issues that you might want to uh, address principally, but there are other issues where you definitely would want the feedback of the people and, and see how, um, you know, people think about it, how would it affect them, what their concerns are like the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and our trade deals. Um, you might not have, have a position on this because how could you really if, if it's not even available to be read fully at this point? But, but overall, I think there has been some snippets of news about what it's about and things like that. How would you involve the people on a legislation like that before you make a decision? And what do you feel about trade deals in general? Well, We've got to be careful with trade deals. Uh, I know we've had a, a deficit uh, in that area for, for a long time. Um, but I can think back, if you, if you look historically, uh, I think it was the, uh, uh, I'm going to draw a blank here, I don't know if it was the Taft-Hartley bill, but back in the, the 30s, uh, prior, well, actually in the 20s, prior to uh, the Great Depression, we passed a trade bill that raised tariffs on many countries around the world. And because we did that, once the depression hit, other nations were not willing to trade with us, and they came out of the depression much quicker than we did. So I think there has to be, again, this this uh, involvement of the people to say, here's, here's what the pros and the cons of both sides. I think you have to give both sides to your constituents, because we oftentimes pick one side or another. Uh, but I think you have to give both sides and then provide opportunity for the, when you can, to provide opportunity for input, whether it's through town hall meetings, whether uh, on things like this, blogs like this, or whether it's uh, in a coffee shop, or whether it's uh, on a radio program, or it's using social media better, and making sure that it's out there and available to people to be able to see it, and just give them a summary. Uh, there's some other or, uh, websites that already do that, and you can read summaries of the bills. You can you can read the details of the bill. But I think most people aren't going to do that, so you need to give them points from both sides and let them know where you stand on that on, on this particular issue and what you're leaning to in terms of voting for an issue and why. Uh, and if you can lay all that out, and those who get involved in the process, and again, I think it's an involvement in the process, and for making it as easy as you can to get them involved as well. Don't make it complicated. Uh, like the bills that they send, uh, you know, the 2,000 pages or the 2,200 pages uh, that nobody reads and nobody understands them except for those who wrote it. Uh, so so I, I think access, again, and, and keeping it simple and giving both sides of the, the conversation and trusting in the people to make a good decision and to get involved. 
Sure, and trade obviously is um, another thing that America has built on. I mean, we've been trading for a long time, and it's very important. And the more countries we trade with, the less we're going to go to war with, and we can all, you know, have a peaceful and prosperous world. Uh, would you promise to uh, read all the bills before you sign them? <laughs> I would promise this. I will make sure that I read as many bills as all, fully as I possibly can. I was reading a, um, an article on that, and I'm going to get some of these numbers wrong, but you'll get the idea. Uh, currently, all the pages of legislation that come across a congressman's desk over a two-year span of time, if he were to read or she were to read all of the pages of, of, uh, of legislation coming across her desk over a two-year span, it would take 439 years. Now, wow. that, okay. that, <laughs> so I, that process, I guess I can't that. <laughs> so, so it is crazy what, what we could do. I don't know why we couldn't take a look at any legislation, and maybe this is some kind of legislation I would want to craft and put together, is to limit the number of pages that any bill can be. Um, I think that's something that you could do, because if you're going to make it, I look at the Constitution. You look at that, you read it, you read it in 30 minutes. Um, and it's not all that difficult to understand. So why can't we craft bills that aren't difficult to understand and bills that everybody can read along the way? So I think you can actually pass legislation uh, if you can get enough votes, enough people to, to go along with you so that you can make it simpler and you can streamline it uh, and the average American can understand it. I don't know why we couldn't work toward doing something like that. Sure. I think a lot of people would appreciate that. Um, some quick topics here. Uh, what's your general overall uh, stance on um, the environment and renewable energy? Yeah. Well, when you take a look at we should always do be diligent in taking care of and being stewards of what God gave us. Uh, we should always be doing that. Um, and we should always be looking at technologies and ways of doing it better. Uh, so if I don't know how anybody could be against that. Um, but I think, too, when it comes to renewable energy, we can't pick winners and losers and try to force something upon a nation or a people because it is something that we have and that we want to do and we want to see. Can't do that because the heart and soul of our nation and a nation that is going to prosper anywhere is going to be manufacturing. That's the heart and soul. If you don't create and make things, you can't generate income. We couldn't have this radio program right now. We couldn't be talking on this radio program without manufacturing. And therefore, everything that we have that isn't natural comes out of the ground and we take the materials that come from the ground or, or, or they get their their food supply from the ground uh, we can't have what we've got so manufacturing is essential and we can't force a high cost of energy onto something as important as manufacturing in uh, that drives our, our 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 economy we've got to take a look at that we've got to be smart about this uh, and we can't try to put laws and regulations and burdens on Americans that the rest of the world isn't going to follow. And so we have to look at that quickly. There, we have to have cheap, clean energy to be able to drive the economic machine if we are going to survive as a nation. So I think we've got to be very careful with thinking renewable energy is the answer to that. I mean, we can certainly uh, work on renewable energy and use it where it makes sense and where it's going to do the best and most effective job. Okay, and let me just okay. ask you quickly on um, the war on drugs. Uh, should that be more of a criminal issue or a health issue? Hmm. And that's a good question because every community in the 10 counties to which this district is made up is talking in, in particular about the heroin problem. And I have an organization I started 17 years ago called the Transformation Network. Um, we're a faith-based nonprofit, but what we, one of the things we do is we work with men and women who come out of jails and prisons and people living in poverty. Uh, we take our money, the money we earn working with manufacturers uh, to do that in our communities. 
and I've learned a lot of things. And one of, with drugs, to me, this heroin deal and most drugs, it comes down to a spiritual issue uh, in each person's life. Because I've talked with, I know the people who have struggled and died um, with, um, especially heroin, uh, and they tell me that themselves. It comes down, and they think it's the devil himself involved with that. So. We don't have a solution outside of the spiritual solution, in my opinion. It doesn't mean we don't have people who can't work together on this and to care about people and to take care of them. Uh, to criminalize them, uh, we've got to also look. There are victims. There are victims, too. The victims in this process aren't just those who are addicted. The victims also are the ones who, who had crimes perpetrated against them. So we can't say to the people who have been a victim of a crime that uh, this person is is involved in drugs and uh, they're really not a criminal. So we've got to look at both sides of that issue before we can, can, can pass any laws on it. And I do believe in taking care of people, but I believe our communities uh, and our local communities are better equipped to do that than the federal government ever could. So I don't think it's a federal issue. I think it's a state issue. I think it's a local issue. And I think each community needs to take a look at how they want to work through this and solve this problem. Okay. And not talking about hard drugs or, crimes where there's victims um, of course you know there is a criminal justice system for that what about states like Washington Oregon Colorado should they be allowed to have their uh, you, you know states rights to experiments in uh, allowing the legalization of certain drugs if they want to or should the federal government stop them from doing that no the federal government should not stop them from doing that it does the Constitution does not give the federal government uh, a role in that. It was really, I think you said it a little bit earlier, uh, it was set up that the states are the incubators. The states are the places where they can experiment what they, if they want to. So it's going to be up to the, I believe it is a state issue, and uh, the federal government should not get involved in that. Uh, the states, if they decide they want to do something, and the people uh, of those states um, say, we're going to legalize marijuana, and they legalize it, that's up to the states. That doesn't mean I agree with it. It just means I believe it's a state issue. Sure. And do you think at least sure. industrial think hemp least. should be allowed to be um, grown? Industrial hemp being allowed to be grown? Yeah. Well, you know, what um, we have... Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, and also, be people have to import it from other countries, so it can be used in a lot of manufacturing process. It doesn't have, you know, some of the uh, ingredients like the THC, the chemical that gets people, you know, quote-unquote high... Uh, yeah. So right now, actually, it's illegal for farmers to even grow it in most places. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I don't know that that's a federal issue. And should they be allowed to, to grow it for uses out for industrial purposes? I'll be honest with you, I've never really thought about that. That is not something that has been uh, on my mind. But is part of the problem, and it may not be true in the industrial usages, but part of the problem is we do have – all businesses do drug testing. Um, and uh, I think there's a conflict there because they're, they're doing a 10 panel drug test. And if you have drugs in your system, you can't work. So I think that's, that's another issue in this whole process. But as far as the industrialization, I haven't thought about that. I don't really have uh, formulated an opinion at this time. Well, I appreciate your honesty on that. And at least what you're saying is that it's a, I guess a 10th amendment state's, issue there and now are there any local issues um in your district specifically that we didn't address here sir uh i think those are are, are the issues that we're dealing with uh, uh in our local communities in in, in this district I, I think we've done a you've done a good job of covering those and i appreciate you uh, reading the website and and giving me the opportunity to have a conversation with you for, so people can hear um uh, an independent candidate. I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you being on the ballot. So we have this purpose to interview you. And let me ask you one final question, Dan. Who are some of your favorite people, past or present? Uh, well, I'm going to give you some. <laughs> well, one of my favorite people, I guess, would be the characters on the Seinfeld show. So that's one of them. Uh, and I shout that out to a lot of people who I know are listening to this. Um, but, uh, you know, some of my favorite people would be, uh, I've read a lot of history to prepare myself for running for this office. And I guess if I, I, 
some of the favorite people. William Wilberforce would be one of those. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if the audience knows a lot about William Wilberforce, but he was a, um, a man in Parliament in Great Britain back during the slave times in the 1800s um, or even earlier. And uh, he believed that slavery was was horrible and needed to be abolished, but he didn't have any friends in Congress or in Parliament. Uh, but he stuck with it, and he kept pushing, and he kept pushing. And he didn't see any real change for 18 years down the road. And I think that's one of the things that I want the listeners to know, that the issues and problems that we have at the federal level uh, cannot be solved by one man or one woman in one year or or 10. Uh, we have to be vigilant and we have to fight hard to be able to turn this country around and make it healthy again. And I just want to be one part of that to start chipping away at some of the issues that we have problems with and then six years down the road, hand it off to somebody else to be able to pick up that mantle and continue to chip away so that we can see 18, 20 years down the road, some major impacts uh, that that took place uh, during that uh, that period of time. So uh, Will, William Wilberforce would be one of those. And, and um, um, I would tell you that um, I was a Ronald Reagan fan. And uh, I really appreciated the fact that he made America feel good about themselves. Whether you like this politics or not isn't the issue. He at least was positive and made Americans believe again that it was possible. And, and I believe got people engaged in the process. So those are a couple people I would share with you. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. And again, Dan Phillip for Congress.com. That's uh, his website. Dan uh, Philip is an independent candidate running for the U.S. House of Representatives in District 7 in Ohio. Dan, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and letting our audience know some of the other races are going on besides the presidential election this election year and letting people maybe think about outside the box and consider Congress uh, as a way to as a way to represent their interests and um, and as a way to, you know, make change. So good to talk to you today. I hope you have a uh, fantastic Friday, Dan, and good luck in your campaign, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great weekend as well.